So for question 7, evaluate that integral, you spot it straight away. With these three linear factors of the denominator, <coughs> you know you're going to use partial fractions to split them into three logs, and then those logs can join together, just as it says, expressing answer in the form log A over B. So it's partial fractions, and then quickly integrate them into logs. So I'll just speed through this bit. Right, so... Let this original rational expression with these three linear denominators be split into the original three parts. You can put A, B and C over each of the individual linear terms. Then multiply the whole equation through by those three factors, which means each of them is going to be multiplied by the two that they don't have. And then having written it the other way round, the 3x plus 5 can be written on this side here. Right, now the idea is to knock out them out. So to keep A, I want to put negative 1 and talk of the other ones. So I'll have A times 1 times 2 will be put negative into that, will give me 2a is 2, which means a is 1. Right, same for b. If you make x equal negative 2, then others will go up with b times um, negative 1 times 1, and then substitute into that part, which means that negative b will equal negative 1, so b equals 1. And then same for c. Let x equals negative 3 to knock out the other two. So c times, and that'll be negative 2 times negative 1, substitute into the expression there, and you've got 2c is negative 4. Four, which means c equals negative 2. Right, so put that back together. So I've put them back up there, which means you can go on to the integration now. So it's from 1 to 2 of, and that splits into these three parts. It was 1 over that one, plus 1 over that one, but minus 2 over this one, dx. So then I can go back to the logs. So that will be just ln of x plus 1. I'm just going to use the straight bracket, the curled brackets here, plus ln of x plus 2, and there's no alterations in our functions, I've just got derivatives of 1, the tops are just 1's, nothing affects them, plus minus rather, ln of x plus 3, but there's a 2 there, so it'll be 2 times it, and that's to be evaluated from 1 to 2, but all these logs can join together in one log, but first of all I'd have to take that 2 up here to make a squared, so I've got a single log now, I've got ln of x plus 1, x plus 2, over x plus 3 squared, though. I had to take the 2 inside to get the 3 logs to go together. Evaluated from 1 to 2. Now it's just a case I put the numbers in. So it's ln of that first one. 3 times 4 over 5, what's that, that's 5, over 5 squared, minus ln of 2 times 3 over 4 squared. But that can go to a single log. Again, subtracting, so I'll divide them. But I've got fractions, so instead of a fraction, a fraction, I'll do the fraction times the reciprocal. So I've got 12 over 25 for that one, times this one upside down, 16 over 6. So that's going to be ln of the 6 and the 12 will cancel. That will leave me 32 on top and 25 underneath. And that will be the answer then. There you go. Now it's question 7. Number 8. Proofs. 6 marks. Easier than you think. First one. Prove the product of two odd integers is odd. Well, first of all, you have to demonstrate you're actually using odd integers. So what I'll do is I'll set them out. So I'll let the odd integers be this. So I'll say let z1 be 2 m plus 1, and let z2 equal to something else, n plus 1. So there's definitely two odd integers, where m and n are integers, of course. And it says prove that the product of those is odd. Well, what would z1, z2 come to? Well, that would be 2m plus 1 times 2n plus 1. That would be 4mn plus 2m plus, whoops, 2m plus 1, common factor of 2, take it out, I've got 2mn plus m plus n plus 1, by definition that must be an even number, so that part's even plus 1, and an even number plus 1 makes an odd number, so that means that z1, z2 must be odd, so that's the first bit. Part B, a proof by induction. What was it say? Let P be an odd integer. Got it. Prove that P to the N is also odd for all positive integers N. 
Well, positive and this seems natural numbers. Well, test for n equals 1. We'll consider, oh, I'll just put that, n equals 1. That means you've got p to the power 1, which is just p, which is odd by definition. I don't know what the number is, but it told you it was odd to begin with. So this is the important bit. So that means it's true for n equals 1. You need that part. That pegs it down then. It's true at some point. Now, assume that it's odd for some power n equals k. Now that means your inductive hypothesis is p to the power k is odd. You'll need to use that later on, I'll give it a name, that's your inductive hypothesis. And then you have to consider, now you've got to consider the next step. Consider n equals k plus 1. Well, what have you got then? n equals k plus 1. So that means you've got p to the k plus 1. Well, the first step's always when you've got that extra power just to split it. So you've got p times p to the k. Now, p to the k you're saying is odd. p by definition is odd. So that means you've got an odd times an odd since by 1 p to the k is odd, which equals an odd, which you proved in the first part, the product of two odd numbers is odd, and that's true by part a. I'll just run that part again, so you end up with that. It's an odd times an odd, because p was given has been odd, and p to the k was the inductive hypothesis, saying it was odd. So if that was odd, which means that if it is true for n equals k, if p to the k was odd, then it follows that it must be true for n equals k plus 1. And then since it's true for n equals 1, then by the stepping stone, because this just proves if it's true at one stage, it's true for the next. So if it's true for 1, it must be true for 2, and so on. Since true for n equals 1, then by induction, it must be true for all n, where there were the positive integers, which I'll just call n the natural numbers. Right, and that was question 8, part B. Number 9. Obtain the first three non-zero terms of the Maclaurin expansion of this. Now, there's two ways you could do it. You can either work through the derivatives and then find the values of zeros, <coughs> and then put it into the, the series. Or, if you remember the expansions for sine, cos and e, you could just go straight into it and just do it algebraically without any differentiation. Maybe we'll do it that way first of all. If you remembered it, and what you'd have to remember is this. You only need to really remember is e. e to the x is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial. That's actually over 0 factorial over 1 factorial. Plus x cubed over 3 factorial. x to the 4 over 4 factorial. It's quite an easy pattern to remember. Well, I'll put them in. Because that just completes the patterns for all the parts. That's the same as the power of x. Power of 0. 0 factorial defined to be 1. And then it's the sine and the cosine easy because they're just the alternate ones. Cosine starts at 1. Sine starts at 0 when x is 0. So taking the odd terms, they produce the cosine. And taking the even terms, produce the sine. You can remember it that way. The sine of x is just going to be that one. It'll be x. And the difference is it's then minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 5 over 5 factorial minus and so on. And the cosine of x, if you wanted it, would have been the 1 minus the x squared over 2 factorial plus the x to the 4 over the 4 factorial minus again. What you need to do is remember that one and you get sine and cos straight from it. Right, anyway. So, it just says obtain. It doesn't say but obtain by finding the derivatives. It just says obtain, so I'm going to do it that way. So I'm going to say this is equal to, I don't know why I did that, 1 plus, and then expand that. Well, I know the sign. The sign goes x minus x cubed over 3 factorial, plus, if I need to get as high as power 5, because I only want the first three terms, over 5 factorial, I'll just put dot 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 after that, squared. So that's going to be 1 plus. Now, squaring that infinite bracket just means each of these will be taken the term of the bracket times itself. 
each of these will take their turn to multiply the rest. So we'll have x times all of that, but I probably don't need to go very far. Probably need, don't need to go as far as that one, unless something cancels out. And then minus x to the power of 3 over 3 factorial times the whole law. x minus, that's x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 5 over 5 factorial. And then it'd be plus x to the 5. But x to the 5 is going to produce, at the very least, x to the power 6 terms. So unless I need an x to the power 6 term, I'm not even going to go as far as that. So what I've got, I've got 1 plus x squared minus x to the 4 over 3 factorial. Well, there's a good 3 terms. So unless one of them gets knocked out by this, then I don't even need to consider that one. So I'll just leave that just now and see what this produces. Well, this produces an x to the 4. Oh, it's got a minus x to the 4 over 3 factorial. That's OK, because the signs are the same. And then after that, it would be an x to the 6. I don't need any more terms. I don't need any more terms. It's all worked out. I've got 1 plus x squared minus 2 times that. 2x to the 4 over 3 factorial, and the rest are just terms that are higher. So it's the same as 1 plus x squared. Now that 2 will cancel out the 2 from the factorial, just leaving the 3. So that'll be minus a third x to the 4 for the first three terms. So you could do it that way if you could remember just e to the x. Right, so I'll clear that and then do it the derivative way. Right, so to do it the derivative way, well there's the original function, well I'll work that out straight away just to see how far I need to go. So that's going to be 1 plus the sine of 0 is 0, but that's alright because that gives me a 1, so I'll only need 2 more. Right, going through the derivatives. The first derivative is going to be, 1 will disappear being a constant, that'll be 2 times the sine of x times the cosine of x. Rather than have that product, I recognise that as sine 2x. That's handy, but the value of 0 isn't because the sine of 0 is 0, so I need to go again. The second derivative, oh well that's handy because that's going to go to cos of 2x multiplied by the derivative of 2, 2 cos 2x. Well that means that the value of the second derivative will be 2 times 1, which is 2. Just need one more. But I know what's going to happen here because sine and cos just keep rotating between themselves. Cos is going to go to negative sine of 2x multiplied by the 2, so that's negative uh, 4 times it. But well, that means the third one's going to be 0. So I've got to go once more, so I'll go to the fourth one. So sine will go to cos of 2x multiplied by 2, so that's a negative 8, which means that the value of, the value of the fourth derivative at 0 is going to be negative 8 times 1, which is negative 8. Right, now I can just put down the expansion. I want f of x. I could just rattle straight into it. I think I'll put down the pattern for it, because the pattern's quite an easy one. You're going from n equals 0 to infinity of then the nth derivative times x to the n over n factorial. So what have I got? Putting these numbers into it. So for the first one I've got a 1. That's for 0, for n equals 0. So I've got 1 times x to the 0 over 0 factorial. There's a 2. That's for the second one when n is 2. So times x squared over 2 factorial. And I've got a negative 8. For the fourth one, that's x to the 4 over 4 factorial. And it's just a case I'll simplify that out because that's just 1 and that's just 1, so that's just 1. 2 knocks out the 2, just leaving a 1. So it's 1 plus x squared minus. Now, 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. The 4 times the 2 will cancel the 8, just leaving the 3. So minus 1 third x to the power 4 as before for the first three non zero terms in the expansion. Question 9. Number 10. Now, where would you would have liked your nice big rational functions graph, finding your asymptotes and so on for a pocket full of marks? You get this wee thing here for three marks. You've got this little function which looks suspicious like a parabola, but that doesn't really matter. And it just says, is it odd, even, or neither? But the worst thing is it says three marks, and it's so obvious looking at it why it isn't. So, it's just a case of how you can express that. Well, it's obviously not, because it's not symmetrical. It might well be symmetrical about the line x equals 1, but it's not symmetrical about the y-axis, and it's not symmetrical about the origin, half term about the origin, which are the two conditions. But I suppose just state them formally. So if I would say, first of all, the way that you check if it's odd or even is by putting a negative x into it and seeing what happens. If you put negative x into it, and it turns out to be the same as the original value of x, then it's even. If you put the negative x into it and it turns out to be the negative of the same value at x, then it's odd. And if there's no connection, 
then there's no connection and it's neither odd nor even. So for this one, f of what's the connection between the value at negative 2 and the value at 2? Right. Is it the same or is it a negative? No, a negative 2 is way up here, it's not 0, so I can say it's not equal to that. Which means that f of x is not even. What about f of no, I've already said that. Well, I'll just put this down. Is it equal to the negative of it then? Well, no, because the negative of it still isn't 0. So it's not equal to the thing itself, making it not even. It's not equal to the negative of the same values. So f of x is not odd. Well, it's only one thing then. It's nothing. That means that f of x is neither... Whoops, the i hiding in there. It's neither odd... Ooh, odd. Oh, it's Dr. Who, isn't it? It's neither odd nor even. And there it is. Question 10. Question 11. Differential equation equal to zero. Homogeneous. Which means that it's going to be much easier to do this. Well, there's not as many marks, unfortunately. So the first part would be this. Right. Solve the homogeneous part. Find the auxiliary equation. Auxiliary equation. That's going to be m squared plus 4m plus 5 equals zero. 16 take away 20, that's going to be negative. So you're going to have complex roots to this, so it's going to be the one with the sign, but I'll have to write that out. So that won't factorise, in other words. If b squared minus 4ac doesn't produce a perfect square, then it won't factorise, so you'll have to use the formula instead. That'll be negative 4 plus or minus the square root of 2 of 16 take away 20, which is negative 4, which gives me my two answers. So m is going to be dividing by 2, negative 2 plus or minus. The 4 comes out as a root 2, sorry, as a 2, 2 into 2 goes 1. They're left with the square root of negative 1, so it's 2 plus or minus i for those parts, which means that for the complementary function, I'm going to have y equals e to the negative 2x, and that's just one lot of i, plus a cos x plus b sin x for the first part. Now for the second part, it says find the particular solution then when you've got these values, an x and a y value. Now sometimes you get an x, a y and a dy by dx when you differentiate it. But here it's just two pairs, like two points on the, on the graph of it. So it says first of all, when x equals 0, y equals 3. Well, feed that in and see what you've got. So you're going to have 3 equals e to that will just be 0 times a times and the cos of 0 is just going to be 1 and the sine of 0 is just going to be 0 if I can be lazy and do that which just means that and since e to the 0 is 1 you've just got a equals 3 I don't know if I can put down this little working as that so a is 3 which means it now reads y equals e to the negative 2x times 3 cos x plus b sin x. Now I need another equation. It's not the derivative this time, it's just back to x's and y's. But it says this time a bit nastier. x equals pi up in 2, y equals e to the negative pi. Ooh. So, e to the negative pi equals e to the negative <coughs> pi up in 2, 2 times pi up in 2, times 3 cos pi up in 2, plus b sine pi up in 2, right all out this time. So you've got e to the negative pi equals, and that's just e to the negative pi, times the cos of pi up in 2, well that's when it goes down to 0, so that one disappears, plus, and that one goes up to 1, so plus b, which just means that 1 equals 1, oh, sorry, that cancels out to 1 equals b, so b equals 1. The final answer, y equals e to the negative 2x times 3 cos x plus just one law of sin x. Final answer. Right, for number 12, proof by contradiction. It says, proof by contradiction that if x is an irrational number, 
then 2 plus x is irrational. So by contradiction means I'm going to assume the contrary. I'm going to take a contrary standpoint. So let's just say this. Let's just assume that x is rational. Now this only works in 50-50 situations. It has to be clear-cut one or the other. It's either irrational or it's rational. So there's no in-betweens. So that if it's rational, it can't be irrational and vice versa. So assume it is rational. Now that means that it can be written, a rational number means any number that can be written as a fraction where the a and the b are integers. Or supposedly speaking, only requires the bottom one or the top one rather to be an integer. The bottom one can just be a natural number because only one of them to be a negative to generate the Anyway, just leaving that. Well, so what happens? So that means that 2 plus x will be 2 plus a over b adding them into a single fraction, that'll be 2b plus a over b. But that's a rational number. That's a rational number since b was an integer and 2a, 2b plus a is also an integer formed by adding integers. That's called closure. So through closure, that's also a rational number. I'll put down the reason. Since 2b plus a is an integer, by closure, which is probably not meant. That just meant within the set of operations within integers, adding and subtracting integers produces, always produces an integer. But it says the result of 2 plus x is meant to be irrational. And I've got a rational answer. Contradiction. Which means you have a contra... a contradiction. Because it said it should have been rational. We'll call that one. Contradiction by 1. Which means then that the whole thing must be false and so it isn't rational which means that it must have been irrational all along. So x is irrational. And that's that part done. So, question 13. Given these two... So, question 13. You can spot it. Parametric equations. X and Y are expressed in terms of some other single parameter T, something that's very useful later on. Note this question later on in maths. And you define dy by dx, you define the gradient of the curve. Well, I can't differentiate Y with respect to X because it's expressed in terms of T, so I can only find dy by dt. That was easy. 3t squared minus 5 up and oh, minus 5t, because you're multiplying by 2. Same for x. dx by dt, you happen to know that pattern, it's 1 over the square root of the thing, or you can go via indices. And then, if I want dy by dx, then I can only do dy by dt, and then multiply by dt by dx. So that would be 3t squared minus 5t. That's dt by dx is the reciprocal of that. So either over the thing, which would be nasty, or times the reciprocal times 2 root t. And then it says in its simplest form, well that means, does that mean multiplying out the bracket then? So that would be 6 times, that means I have to go to index form. So I'm going to have 6t, 2 plus a half is t to the 5 up and 2, minus 10 times t to the power 1 and a half, 3 up and 2. And then you think, is that actually simpler? Because you look at that you think, oh, common factor come out of 2. And t with nasty powers, you should take out t to the nasty power, which is the root 2, which takes you back to this which is the form. It's a clash of cultures there. It's a clash between the indices and the radicals. I'll just leave it like that. I was an expert. Uh, show that the second derivative, so I want d squared y by dx squared, can be written as at squared plus bt and get a and b. Right? Fair enough. Well again, dx dy by dx has been written in terms of t, so I can only differentiate the dy by dx with respect to t and then multiply by dt by dx. So I've got to differentiate that. Oh well, that's actually in a better form to just get it kicked off straight away because that's just multiplied by the power. So multiplying the power is going to give me 15t, take one off the power, to the power 3 upon 2, minus multiplying by the power, and that's going to give me, when I do that, that's going to give me 15 again, 15t to the power, knocking one off the power, a half, times and I'll have to concede to the indices here, dt by dx, which is the reciprocal of that, so it's times 2t to the power of half, and then just multiply it all out. So that's going to give me 30, and that knocks that nicely up to a 4 upon 2, which is squared, 
minus 30 again, t to the power 1, which is just t, which is what it said. It says, so it can be written in the form of at squared plus bt. So I think I'll finish off by saying that. So that means it's in the form of at squared plus, is it plus or minus? Oh, at squared plus bt, where a equals 30 and b equals negative 30. Then that would be the answer to that part. That's the part I actually wanted there. So last but then, obtain the equation of the tangent to the curve which passes through the point of inflection. So it's some point of inflection on this curve. Now at a point of inflection, it's the second derivative that will locate it. The first derivative doesn't need to be zero there. At a point of inflection, the rate of change of the gradient is momentarily zero. For instance, it may have stopped decreasing and then start increasing again. It doesn't mean it needs to level off to zero. So at some point of inflection, I want the equation of that line. Well, you can identify the point because it will have stopped decreasing and, or vice versa, started increasing. In other words, the second derivative will be zero. That will find you the value of t, the parameter, which you can put into the first derivative to get the gradient, and to these two to get the coordinates of the point. So the first thing would be, when does it stop curving, this measure of curvature here then? So at the point of inflection, that derivative should equal zero. So 30t squared minus 30t should equal 0. So 30t times t minus 1 should equal 0. So t equals 0 or 1, but t can't be 0, which means t is 1, and I've taken up most of the space. Now it's just a case of feeding it into those parts. So t is 1. I've got room to put up, put up here. So if t is 1, that means that y would be 1 cubed minus 5 upon 2 times 1 squared, although 1 to the any power is just 1. So that's going to be 1 minus 5 upon 2, so that's negative 3 upon 2. x is going to be the square root of 1, which is just 1. So I've got the point 1, negative 3 upon 2. Next thing is its gradient. This is getting a bit messy because I don't have enough space to set it out properly. Next thing is its gradient. So I'll feed it into the gradient equation. So that's going to be 6 times the 1 to the power of anything. That's just 6 times 1. Take away 10 times 1. So that's going to be negative 4. So the gradient's negative 4. Finally, get the equation of the tangent. That'll just be y minus b is mx minus a. So y minus, so that'll be plus 3 upon 2, is negative 4 times x minus 1. Fractions, double everything. 2y plus 3, that'll be 8x, and that'll be plus 8. Make it all positive, whichever way you like. 8x plus 2y minus the 8 minus 5 equals 0 for the equation of the tangent. That's question 13.